Welcome to the RPTM podcast, the show that breaks down the myths of monolithic history and tells our story through multiple lenses. I'm your host, Professor Ryan Lancaster. Today's episode is partially underwritten by you, the listener. Find out ways to support the podcast on the website, ryanglancaster.com. Episode 51, Aftermath of War, Pinkertons, Camel Corps, and the King of Beaver Island. Essentialism is the view that things have a set of characteristics crucial to their identity. Historically, ideas that declare that identities such as race, ethnicity, or gender are important factors have been shown to have harmful or toxic effects in many cases. Essentialist thinking lies at the core of many prejudices and extremist doctrines. Almost every component of modern Western history can offer troubling instances of doctors and scientific specialists classifying humans into basic types. It is not surprising that history students view science and medicine as essentialist areas. In 2015, Associate Professor Lisa Foreman Cody wrote an article for the American Historical Association about race essentialism. She says, Essentialism in history as a field of study entails discerning and documenting essential cultural aspects of a particular nation or civilization in the assumption that they can comprehend a people or culture in this way. Sometimes such essentialism leads to declarations of a respected national or cultural identity, or, its contrary, the denunciation of a culture based on assumed fundamental characteristics. Herodotus, for instance, asserts that Egyptian civilization is feminized and maintains a softness, which has made Egypt easy to overthrow. To what capacity Herodotus was an essentialist being a matter of discussion, he is also credited with not essentializing the image of the Athenian identity or contrast between the Greeks and the Persian, who are the matter of his history. These and other instances of racial essentialism render lively classroom conversations. Students acknowledge how specialists have shown themselves as authoritative, adept at constructing ubiquitous assertions about human essence, often on the grounds of even anecdotal proof. It's easy for researchers to comprehend that historical essentialist opinions have mirrored modern views about race, gender, sex, and other categories. Fortifying hierarchical power dynamics. Consequently, essentialism in history delivers some particularly explicit stories to illustrate the working of principles. It is so easy to gather racial essentialism in such general terms that it acts as a straw man with little historical nuance. By clumping together all unsavory items about race, gender, sex, and other human classifications as essentialists, we are in jeopardy of treating all isms as operating the same way. Professor Cody tells us that all essentialism was and is the same. She says, We should not essentialize essentialism, especially if we hope to challenge it in contemporary conversations and policies. As we dive deep into the minds of historical thought, we need not stray too far from my original history rules. Much of what I write about and speak about is a celebration of multiple lenses when investigating history. Race indeed is a tenet of anyone's story, but only one. Class, gender, and even ethnicity create a more profound and fuller picture of a person or a historical event. The American experience for a Chinese day laborer varied incredibly between a man or a woman in the 19th century American West. The Aftermath of War Historians are less sure about the results of the post-war reconstruction, especially regarding Freedmen's second-class citizenship and poverty. The North and West grew rich while the once-rich South became poor for a century. The national political power of the enslavers and wealthy Southerners ended. Historians have debated whether the Confederacy could have won the war. Most scholars argue that Confederate victory was at least possible. Historians assert that the North's advantage in population and resources made Northern success likely but not guaranteed. 
He also argues that if the Confederacy had fought using unconventional tactics, it would have more easily been able to hold out long enough to exhaust the Union. Confederates did not need to invade and hold enemy territory to win but were only required to fight a defensive war to convince the North that the cost of winning was too high. The North needed to conquer and hold vast stretches of enemy territory and defeat Confederate armies to win. Lincoln was not a military dictator and could continue to fight the war only if the American public supported the continuation of the war. The Confederacy sought to win independence by outlasting Lincoln, however, after Atlanta fell and Lincoln defeated McClellan in the election of 1864, all hope for a political victory for the South ended. At that point, Lincoln had secured the support of the Republicans, War Democrats, the border states, formerly enslaved people, and the neutrality of Britain and France. By defeating the Democrats and McClellan, he also defeated the Copperheads, who had wanted a negotiated peace with the Confederate States of America. Some scholars argue that the Union held an insurmountable long-term advantage over the Confederacy in industrial strength and population. Confederate actions, they claim, only delayed defeat. A minority view among historians is that the Confederacy lost because people did not will hard enough and long enough to win. However, most historians reject the argument. Even as the Confederacy was visibly collapsing in 1865, he says most Confederate soldiers were fighting hard. The Emancipation Proclamation was an effective use of the President's war powers. The Confederate government failed in its attempt to get Europe involved in the war militarily, particularly Great Britain and France. Southern leaders needed European powers to help break up the blockade the Union had created around the southern ports and cities. Also necessary was Lincoln's eloquence in rationalizing the national purpose and his skill in keeping the border states committed to the Union cause. Lincoln's naval blockade was 95% effective at stopping trade goods, as a result, imports and exports to the South declined significantly. The abundance of European cotton and Britain's hostility to the institution of slavery, along with Lincoln's Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico naval blockades, severely decreased any chance that either Britain or France would enter the war. The Union victory had a significant impact on the course of world history. The Union victory energized popular democratic forces. A Confederate victory, on the other hand, would have meant a new birth of slavery, not freedom. The North's victory decisively proved the durability of democratic government. On the other hand, Confederate independence would have established an American model for reactionary politics and race-based repression that would likely have cast an international shadow into the 20th century and perhaps beyond. Scholars have debated the effects of the war on political and economic power in the South. The prevailing view is that the Southern planter elite retained its powerful position in the South. However, a 2017 study challenges this, noting that while some Southern elites included their economic status, the turmoil of the 1860s created more significant opportunities for economic mobility in the South than in the North. The war resulted in at least 1,030,000 casualties, or 3% of the population, including about 620,000 soldier deaths, two-thirds by disease, and 50,000 civilians. A novel way of calculating losses by looking at the deviation of the death rate of men of fighting age from the norm through analysis of census data found that at least 627,000 and at most 888,000 people, but most likely 761,000 people, died through the war. The war's cost on American lives was as great as in all of the nation's other wars combined through the Vietnam War. Black troops made up 10% of the Union death toll, 15% of Union deaths from disease and less than 3% of those killed in battle. Losses among African Americans were high. In the last year and a half and from all reported casualties, approximately 20% of all African Americans in the military died during the Civil War. Notably, their mortality rate was significantly higher than that of white soldiers. While 15.2% of United States volunteers and just 8.6% of white regular army troops died, 20.5% of United States colored troops died. While the figures of 360,000 army deaths for the Union and 260,000 for the Confederacy remained commonly cited, they are incomplete. In addition to many Confederate records being missing, partly due to Confederate widows not reporting deaths due to being ineligible for benefits, both armies only counted troops who died during their service and not the tens of thousands who died of wounds or diseases after being discharged.
This often happened only a few days or weeks later. Analyzing the number of dead by using census data to calculate the deviation of the death rate of men of fighting age from the norm suggests that at least 627,000 and at most 888,000, but most likely 761,000 soldiers, died in the war. This would break down to approximately 350,000 Confederate and 411,000 Union military deaths, going by the proportion of Union to Confederate battle losses. Deaths among formerly enslaved people have proven much harder to estimate due to the lack of reliable census data at the time. However, they were considered considerable, as formerly enslaved people were set free or escaped in massive numbers in an area where the Union Army did not have sufficient shelter, doctors, or food. Hundreds of thousands of enslaved people died during the war from disease, starvation, or exposure, and if these deaths were counted in the war's total, the death toll would exceed one million. Losses were far higher than during the recent defeat of Mexico, which saw roughly 13,000 American deaths, including fewer than 2,000 killed in battle, between 1846 and 1848. One reason for the high number of battle deaths during the war was the continued use of tactics similar to those of the Napoleonic Wars at the turn of the century, such as charging. With the advent of more accurate rifled barrels, minier balls, and repeating firearms such as the Spencer repeating rifle and the Henry repeating rifle, soldiers were mowed down when standing in lines in the open. This led to the adoption of trench warfare, a style of fighting that defined much of World War I. Pinkertons in 1842, Alan Pinkerton immigrated to Chicago, and opened a cooperage or barrel-making business. His detective career began five years later when he stumbled upon a band of counterfeiters while scrounging for lumber on an island in the Fox River. The Scotsman conducted informal surveillance on the gang and was hailed as a local hero after he helped police make arrests. The affair was in everybody's mouth, he later wrote, and I suddenly found myself called upon from every quarter to undertake matters requiring detective skill. Pinkerton soon won a gig as a small-town sheriff. He went on to work as Chicago's first police detective and as an agent for the U.S. Post Office. Around 1850, he opened the private investigation firm that became the Pinkerton National Detective Agency. The Pinkerton Agency first made its name in the late 1850s for hunting down outlaws and providing private security for railroads. As the company's profile grew, its iconic logo, a large, unblinking eye accompanied by the slogan We Never Sleep gave rise to the term private eye as a nickname for detectives. In 1856, 23-year-old widow Kate Warren walked into Pinkerton's Chicago office and requested a job as a detective. Alan Pinkerton was hesitant to hire a female investigator. Still, he gave in after Warren convinced him that she could worm out secrets in many places to which male detectives couldn't gain access. True to her word, Warren proved to be an expert at working undercover, once busting a thief by cozying up to his wife and convincing her to reveal the location of the loot. During another case, she got a suspect to feed her crucial information by disguising herself as a fortune teller. Pinkerton would later list Warren as one of the best investigators he ever hired. Following her death in 1868, he buried her in his family plot. Shortly before Abraham Lincoln's first inauguration in March 1861, Alan Pinkerton traveled to Baltimore on a mission for a railroad company. The detective was investigating rumors that Southern sympathizers might sabotage the rail lines to Washington, D.C. Still while gathering undercover intelligence, he learned that a secret cabal also planned to assassinate Lincoln, then on a whistle-stop tour as he switched trains in Baltimore on his way to the capital. Pinkerton immediately tracked down the president-elect and informed him of the alleged plot. With the help of Kate Warren and several other agents, he arranged for Lincoln to secretly board an overnight train and pass through Baltimore several hours ahead of his published schedule. Pinkerton operatives also cut telegraph lines to ensure the conspirators couldn't communicate with one another, and Warren had Lincoln pose as her invalid brother to cover up his identity. The president-elect arrived safely in Washington the following day, but his decision to skirt through Baltimore saw him lampooned and labeled a coward in the press. Meanwhile, none of the would-be assassins was ever arrested, leading some historians to conclude that Pinkerton may have exaggerated or even invented the threat. Alan Pinkerton was a staunch abolitionist and union man, 
and during the Civil War, he organized a secret intelligence service for General George B. McClellan's Army of the Potomac. Operating under the name Edge Allen, Pinkerton set up spy rings behind enemy lines and infiltrated Southern sympathizer groups in the North. He even had agents interview escaped enslaved people to glean information about the Confederacy. The operation produced reams of intelligence, but not all proved accurate. A famous misstep came during 1862's Peninsula Campaign when Pinkerton reported that the Confederate forces around Richmond were more than twice their size. McClellan believed the faulty intel, and despite outnumbering the rebels by a large margin, he delayed his advance and made repeated calls for reinforcements. One of the many ways the Pinkertons revolutionized law enforcement was with their so-called rogues gallery, a collection of mugshots and case histories that the agency used to research and keep track of wanted men. Along with noting suspects distinguishing marks and scars, agents collected newspaper clippings and generated rap sheets detailing their previous arrests, known associates, and areas of expertise. Government officials wouldn't assemble a more sophisticated criminal library until the early 20th century, and the birth of the FBI. During frontier expansion, express companies and railroads often employed the Pinkertons as Wild West bounty hunters. The agency famously infiltrated the Reno Gang, perpetrators of the nation's first train robbery, and later chased after Butch Cassidy and his Wild Bunch. The Pinkertons usually got their man, but in the 1870s, they spent months engaged in a fruitless hunt for the bank robbers Jesse and Frank James. One of their agents was murdered while trying to infiltrate the brothers' Missouri-based gang, and two more died in a shootout. The hunt ended in 1875 when the Pinkertons launched a raid on the James brothers' mother's house in Clay County, Missouri. Frank and Jesse were nowhere to be found, they'd been tipped off, but the Pinkertons got into an argument with their mother, Zerelda Samuel. During the standoff, a member of the detective's posse tossed an incendiary device through Samuel's window, blowing part of her arm off and killing the James brothers' eight-year-old half-brother. The botched raid turned public opinion against the Pinkertons. After seeing his detectives denounced as murderers in the papers, Alan Pinkerton reluctantly called off his war against the James gang. Jesse would elude the authorities for another seven years before being killed by an assassin's bullet in 1882. Along with their exploits in the Wild West, the Pinkertons also had a more sinister reputation as the paramilitary wing of big business. Industrialists used them to spy on unions or act as guards and strikebreakers, and detectives clashed with workers on several occasions. During an 1892 strike by the Amalgamated Association of Iron and Steel Workers, the Carnegie Steel Company paid some 300 Pinkertons to act as security at its mill in Homestead, Pennsylvania. After arriving at the plant on river barges, the agents, squared off with thousands of striking workers in an all-day battle waged with guns, bricks, and dynamite. By the time the outnumbered Pinkertons finally surrendered, at least a dozen people were dead and several more wounded. The fallout from the melee crippled the Steel Union, but many also branded the Pinkertons as hired thugs, leading several states to pass laws banning outside guards in labor disputes. After Alan Pinkerton died in 1884, Control of his agency fell to his two sons, Robert and William. The company continued to grow under their watch, and by the 1890s, it boasted 2,000 detectives and 30,000 reserves, more men than the standing army of the United States. Fearful that the agency could be hired as a private mercenary army, the state of Ohio later outlawed the Pinkertons altogether. By the early 20th century, the Pinkertons' crime-fighting duties had primarily been absorbed by local police forces and agencies like the FBI. The company lived on as a private security firm and guard service, however, and still operates today under the shortened name Pinkerton. Camel Corps the United States Camel Corps was a mid-19th century experiment by the United States Army using camels as pack animals in the southwestern United States. Although the camels proved hardy and well suited to travel through the region, the Army declined to adopt them for military use. The Civil War interfered with the experiment, which was eventually abandoned, and they were sold the animals at auction. In 1836, Major George H. Crossman, United States Army, who was convinced from his experiences in the Indian Wars in Florida that camels would be useful as beasts of burden, 
encouraged the War Department to use camels for transportation. In 1848 or earlier, Major Henry C. Wayne conducted a more detailed study and recommended the importation of camels to the War Department. Wayne's opinions agreed with those of then-Senator Jefferson Davis of Mississippi. Davis was unsuccessful until he was appointed as Secretary of War in 1853 by President Franklin Pierce. When U.S. forces were required to operate in arid and desert regions, the President and Congress began to take the idea seriously. Davis found the Army needed to improve transportation in the southwestern U.S., which he and most observers thought a great desert. In his annual report in 1854, Davison wrote, I again invite attention to the advantages to be participated in the use of camels and dromedaries for military and other purposes. On March 3, 1855, the U.S. Congress appropriated $30,000, or the equivalent of almost $900,000 in 2022, for the project. A report entitled, Purchase of Camels for the Purpose of Military Transportation, was issued by Davis in 1857. In later years, Edward Fitzgerald Beale reportedly told his son, Truxton, that the idea of using camels came when he explored Death Valley with Kit Carson. Jefferson Davis, the then Secretary of War, sympathized with Beale. Beale persuaded his friend and Kingsman Lieutenant David Dixon Porter to apply for command of the expedition to acquire the camels. Beale's diaries or papers do not support that account. Major Wayne was assigned to procure the camels. On June 4, 1855, Wayne departed New York City on board the USS Supply under the command of then Lieutenant David Dixon Porter. After arriving in the Mediterranean Sea, Wayne and Porter began procuring camels. Stops include Tunisia, Malta, Greece, Turkey, and Egypt. They acquired 33 animals, including two Bactrian, 29 dromedaries, one dromedary calf, and one bugdi, which is a cross between a Bactrian and a female dromedary. The two officers also acquired pack saddles and covers, confident that they could not purchase proper harnesses in the United States. Wayne and Porter hired five camel drivers, some Arab and some Turkish, and on February 15, 1856, USS Supply set sail for Texas. Porter established strict rules for the care, watering, and feeding of the animals in his charge. No experiments were conducted regarding how long a camel could survive without water. During the crossing, one male camel died, but two calves were born and survived the trip. On May 14, 1856, 34 camels were safely unloaded in Indianola, Texas. All the surviving animals were in better health than when the vessel sailed for the United States. Porter sailed again for Egypt to acquire more camels on Davis's orders. While Porter was on a second voyage, Wayne marched the camels from the first voyage to Camp Verde, Texas, by way of San Antonio. On February 10, 1857, USS Supply returned with a herd of 41 camels. At the same time, Porter was on his second mission. The newly acquired animals joined the first herd at Camp Verde, which had been officially designated as the Camel Station. The Army had 70 camels. Wayne attempted a breeding program for the camels. Still, his plans were put aside when Secretary Davis wrote that the animals were to be tested to determine if the Corps could use them to accomplish a military objective. Early in the Civil War, an attempt was made to use the camels to carry mail between Fort Mojave, New Mexico Territory, on the Colorado River, and New San Pedro, California. Still, the attempt was unsuccessful after the commanders of both posts objected. Later in the war, the Army had no further interest in the animals and sold them at auction in 1864. The last animals from California were reportedly seen in Arizona in 1891. In the spring of 1861, Camp Verde fell under Confederate hands until recaptured in 1865. The Confederate commander issued a receipt to the United States for 12 mules, 80 camels, and two Egyptian camel drivers. They were both reports of the animals being used to transport baggage, but no evidence of their being assigned to Confederate units. When Union troops reoccupied Camp Verde, they were estimated to be more than 100 camels at the camp, but there may have been others roaming the countryside. In 1866, the government was able to round up 66 camels, which it sold to Bethel Copwood. The U.S. Army's camel experiment was complete. The last year a camel was seen in the vicinity of Camp Verde was 1875, and the animal's fate is unknown. The camel experiment failed because it was supported by Jefferson Davis, who left the United States to become President of the Confederate States of America. 
The U.S. Army was a horse and mule organization whose soldiers did not have the skills to control a foreign asset. One of the male animals at Fort Tehan was killed by another male during rutting season. Lieutenant Sylvester Maori forwarded the dead animal's bones to the Smithsonian Institution, where they were placed on display. The King of Beaver Island In the 1840s, James Jesse Strang was a lawyer in the Wisconsin Territory who converted to Mormonism just five months before Joseph Smith, the architect of the Mormon faith, was slain by a mob in Illinois. Smith's death formed a predicament for the church, with a handful of people vying to succeed him. Brigham Young is the most well-known. But Strang produced a letter penned by Smith, postmarked days before Smith's assassination in 1844, which named Strang his successor. Strang also declared an angel came to him to ordain him as ruler of God's people. Brigham Young took his followers to Salt Lake City, where the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is now headquartered. James Strang took his followers first to Varee, Wisconsin. Then, in 1847, Strang noted he'd had a dream. I beheld a land amidst wide waters covered with large timber, with a deep, broad bay on one side of it. When Strang and his followers came to Beaver Island in Lake Michigan, the year-round residents included three white families, a handful of white men with Indian wives, 20 or 30 other men who had families elsewhere. Most of the men were fishermen, and the fishing business helped increase the number of men and boys on the island to about 100 in the summer. And on the island's northern side, there were 40 to 50 Indian families, predominantly Chippewas, who also lived mainly through fishing. Over the next nine years, Strang would change the island into a bustling outpost. He and his followers built roads and homes and printed a newspaper, The Northern Islander, which started weekly and became a daily. It was the only daily newspaper north of Grand Rapids, Michigan, during the time. In the mid-19th century, the lakes were like a financial highway, and the Mormons made money selling cordwood to passing steamers. The Mormons were very industrious. They made a lot of the modern infrastructure of the island. They cleared land for farming, they tried to build water projects like canals and irrigation. There was a lot of hostility toward the Mormon faith in the United States then. It was still a reasonably young religion with theocratic proclivities. There was a lot of bitterness against Strang and a lot of trepidations. But there were increasing tensions between Strang and his followers and the non-Mormons on Beaver Island. In 1850, Strang was crowned king in a coronation rite choreographed by a man in his inner circle who'd been an actor. Strang supposedly wore a red robe and had a cardboard crown. Strang never evidently claimed authority over anything but his church. But it seems his control over islanders did grow beyond just his supporters, some Mormons did buy property, but a lot of it was blessed for the church and portioned out by Strang to the different Mormon families living there. Strang also wooed dissension among his followers when he changed his views about marriage and became a polygamist, ultimately marrying five women. As it turns out, declaring yourself king can draw unwanted attention from the US government. The same year as Strang's coronation, he was apprehended and charged with treason and other crimes. A Navy vessel patrolling the Great Lakes, the USS Michigan, hauled Strang and some of his men to Detroit for a trial. They were acquitted. The episode seemed to bolster Strang's popularity. Strang led his defense and was a very charismatic speaker. A few years later, he was elected to his first of two terms in the Michigan legislature. While Strang held many progressive ideas, such as preserving woodlands, many judged his tyrannical rule insufferable. One declaration, for example, stipulated the clothing of strangeite women. Two women refused compliance, and Strang had their husbands beaten, an act rendered more bearable after learning one of them in the act of adultery. While healing from their floggings, the husbands plotted against Strang. On June 16, 1856, the U.S. naval gunboat USS Michigan entered the harbor of Street James, and Strang was requested aboard. As Strang walked along the dock, the two conspirators shot him from behind and then ran in the gunboat, which departed and disembarked the men on Mackinac Island. Neither man was charged or sentenced for the murder. After Strang died of his wounds on July 9, 1856, mobs from Mackinac Island and St. Helena Island arrived and expelled the Strangites. They then numbered roughly 2,600 from Beaver Island and reclaimed the island. 
Upon removal of the Strangeites, local government in Manitou County, which included Beaver Island, almost discontinued. Court sessions and elections were seldom held, county offices were often empty, and the region developed a lawless reputation. Pony Express The Pony Express was an American Express mail service that used relays of horse-mounted riders. It operated between Missouri and California from April 3, 1860, to October 26, 1861. It was conducted by Central Overland California and Pikes Peak Express Company. During its 18 months of operation, the Pony Express reduced the time for messages to travel between the East and West U.S. coast to about 10 days. It was vital for tying the new U.S. state of California with the rest of the United States. It became the West's most direct means of East-West communication before the first transcontinental telegraph was established. Despite a heavy subsidy, the Pony Express was not a financial success and went bankrupt in 18 months when they established a faster telegraph service. Nevertheless, it demonstrated that a unified transcontinental communications system could be installed and operated year-round. When replaced by the telegraph, the Pony Express quickly became romanticized and became part of the law of the American West. Its reliance on the ability and endurance, hardy riders, and fast horses was seen as evidence of the rugged American individualism of the frontier times. In the mid-19th century, California-bound mail had to either be taken overland by a 25-day stagecoach or spend months inside a ship during a long sea voyage. The Pony Express, meanwhile, had an average delivery time of just 10 days. To achieve this remarkable speed, company owners William H. Russell, William B. Waddell, and Alexander Majors set up a string of nearly 200 relief stations across what is now Missouri, Kansas, Nebraska, Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, Nevada, and California. Lone horseback riders would ride between stations at a breakneck pace, switching mounts every 10 to 15 miles and then handing their cargo off to a new courier after 75 to 100 miles. The relay system allowed mail to crisscross the frontier in record time. The company's personal best came in March 1861, when riders carried the inaugural address of Abraham Lincoln from Nebraska to California in just seven days, 17 hours. Despite its enduring place in Old West legend, the Pony Express never turned a profit during its year-and-a-half history. The company began making deliveries in April 1860. Still, service ground to a halt just a few weeks later when the Pyramid Lake War erupted between the United States and the Paiute Indians. The temporary shutdown cost the company $75,000. It continued to hemorrhage cash over the next few months due to high operations costs and failure to secure a government mail contract. Though hailed in the press for its efficiency and adventurous spirit, the Pony Express eventually folded in October 1861, losing as much as $200,000. Since speed was its primary goal, the Pony Express went to great lengths to keep its horses' loads as light as possible. Rather than burly cowboys, most of the riders were small, wiry men who weighed between 100 and 125 pounds, roughly the same size as a modern horse racing jockey. Their average age was around 20, but it wasn't unusual for teenagers as young as 14 to be hired. One man named Bronco Charlie Miller claimed he was only 11 years old when he first joined the Pony Express. In exchange for their $100 to 150 monthly salaries, a substantial sum for the time, Pony Express riders were expected to take a loyalty oath that reads. I do hereby swear, before the great and living God, that during my engagement, and while an employee of Russell, Majors, and Waddle, I will, under no circumstances, use profane language, that I will drink no intoxicating liquors, that I will not quarrel or fight with any other employee of the firm, and that in every respect I will conduct myself honestly, be faithful to my duties, and so direct all my acts as to win the confidence of my employers, so help me God. Those who broke the rules risked being dismissed without pay, but few Pony Express employees followed the pledge to the letter. Liquor flowed freely at relief stations, and an eyewitness named Richard Burton reported that he scarcely ever saw a sober rider. To cut down on weight and facilitate swift horse and rider changes, the Pony Express used a type of mailbag known as a mochila the Spanish word for knapsack. This consisted of a leather cover draped over the saddle and held by the rider's weight. 
It featured four padlocked pockets, three for mail and one for the rider's time card, and could hold up to 20 pounds of cargo. At each relief station, riders would grab the mochila off one mount and then throw it over the next, allowing them to switch horses in just two minutes. The speed of the Pony Express didn't come cheap. In its early days, the service cost $5 for every half ounce of mail, the equivalent of some $130 today. They later reduced prices to just $1 but remained too high for standard mail. Instead, they mainly used the service to deliver newspaper reports, government dispatches, and business documents, most printed on tissue-thin paper to keep costs and weight down. In May 1860, Robert Pony Bob Haslam took off on the most legendary ride in Pony Express history. The 20-year-old was scheduled to make his usual 75-mile run from Friday's station east to Buckland Station in Nevada. Upon arriving at Buckland, however, he found that his relief rider was petrified of the Paiute Indians, who had been attacking stations along the route. When the other man refused to take the mail, Haslam jumped back in the saddle and rode on, eventually completing a 190-mile run before delivering his mochila at Smith's Creek. After a brief rest, he mounted a fresh horse and retraced his steps back to Friday's station, at one point passing a relay outpost that the pates had burned. By the time he finally returned to his home station, Pony Bob had traveled 380 miles in less than 40 hours, a Pony Express record. Pony Express riders had to deal with extreme weather conditions, harsh terrain, and the threat of attacks by bandits and Indians. Still, life may have been even more dangerous for the stockkeepers who operated the relief stations. Their outposts were usually crude, dirt floor hovels equipped with little more than sleeping quarters and corrals for the horses. Many were located in remote sections of the frontier, making them highly vulnerable to ambush. Accounts differ, but Indians reportedly attacked or burned several relay stations during the Pyramid Lake War in the summer of 1860, killing as many as 16 stockhands. By contrast, only a handful of riders, six, according to the National Park Service, died in the line of duty during the entire history of the Pony Express. In his autobiography, the famed frontier showman William Buffalo Bill Cody claimed he served as a Pony Express rider at 14. He even alleged that he once rode a record 384 miles in a single run. But while Cody almost certainly worked as a messenger for the owners of the Pony Express, there is no record of him ever carrying the mail, and evidence suggests he was probably in school in Kansas during the company's brief history. Whatever Cody's involvement with Pony Express was, there's no doubt that he later kept its memory alive with his famous Wild West vaudeville shows, which featured Pony Express riders and horse swaps as a recurring stunt from 1883 until 1916. For all its financial troubles, the Pony Express didn't indeed collapse until a better alternative appeared on the scene. The company had spent its brief history bridging the gap between the eastern and western telegraph lines. Still, it was finally rendered obsolete on October 24, 1861, when Western Union completed the transcontinental telegraph line at Old Lake City. The Pony Express ceased service just two days later. Despite operating for only 19 months, its riders had successfully delivered 35,000 pieces of mail and traveled more than half a million miles across the American frontier. You've been listening to the RPTM podcast. If you like what you hear, please rate us on whatever platform you're listening on. Join us again next week when we talk about the seen and unseen of U.S. history. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. Also, for more information, check out the show notes on my website. The show was produced by me. Our editor is me. Written and researched by me. Music is Down South by Bliv Beats. I'm Ryan Lancaster, and this was the RPTM Podcast.